In this video, we will describe movement of the removable partial denser in function. A basic understanding of these motions can assist in partial denser design and make sense of the various components and their role. These movements occur in three planes while the partial denser is in function. Although they occur in all removable partial dentures, they are easier to control in the all toothborne partial. In the tooth tissue supported partial, these movements can cause trauma to the supporting tissue and aggravation for the patient. These movements can be controlled to an extent by design and regular maintenance of the partial denture. The clasp assembly rest, when engaged under function, resists vertical displacement of the partial denture into the tissue. Rotational movement of the partial denture occurs about multiple axes of rotation in three planes. These complex motions occur simultaneously and are illustrated here in the mandibular distal extension partial. Forces applied vary in magnitude, duration, direction, and frequency. Repeated tissue trauma may occur slowly over a number of years, resulting in tooth loss. Movement in the sagittal plane is seen as an anterior-posterior rocking of the denture about the fulcrum line. The fulcrum line is an axis of rotation passing through the most posterior abutment on either side of the arch. This may pass through any rigid portion of the clasp assembly contacting the tooth above the height of contour. It is most easily envisioned as passing through each rest. It is important to identify the fulcrum line when it exists. In the distal extension case, the biting force compresses the base into the tissue while lifting the anterior segment away from the teeth. Sticky foods may lift the base away from the supporting tissue, depressing the framework in the anterior area. This seesaw movement may result in trauma to the primary abutment. The illustration demonstrates movement in the sagittal plane. Movement in the sagittal plane is detected by applying digital pressure to the posterior definitive or trial denture base and observing lifting of the anterior segment. The extent of the rocking depends on the quality of the supporting tissues, but can be limited by using well-adapted bases, which are extended within physiologic limits. Indirect retainers are employed on the opposite side of the fulcrum to engage as the base attempts to move away from the soft tissue. Occasionally, the corrected cast procedure or periodic reline may be necessary. Due to the compressible nature of the supporting tissue in the tooth tissue supported partial denture, some rotation about the fulcrum is inevitable. Selection of the clasp assembly is of primary importance in this instance. The following slide demonstrates the use of the RPI clasp, which stands for rest, proximal plate, and eye bar. This clasp is designed to disengage when biting force is applied. The point of rotation of the partial is through the mesial rest, which is anterior to the retentive clasp. As a result, when biting force is applied, the clasp disengages. The short guiding plane rotates into the cervical constriction of the distal aspect of the tooth. The vertical bar minor connector, which connects the mesial rest to the major connector, should not impinge. Movement in the sagittal plane is the easiest of these motions to detect clinically. Rocking may be reduced with well-adapted bases and indirect retainers. Guiding planes should be short, or proximal plates relieved in the gingival one-third to prevent binding when depressed. Rests are placed on the side away from the edentulous area. 
and clasps should not apply undue stress on the abutment. Reciprocating elements must be carefully considered to prevent establishing the fulcrum line through the distal aspect of the tooth. This can most easily be avoided by using the vertical bar minor connector and short proximal plates. The number of posterior teeth should be minimized, as should the width of the occlusal table. Sharp cuspal anatomy increases the chances of interferences to centric and lateral movement. Movement in the horizontal plane is most easily described as fishtailing, as seen in the illustration. This movement may be difficult to detect clinically, but microluxation of the abutment over a period of time, especially with premolars, can cause premature loss of the abutment. This motion may occur whenever a patient closes, especially if there are interferences to closure or lateral movement of the mandible. The addition of extra bracing in the form of plating may help distribute forces due to fishtailing. Interferences to center closure and lateral movement must be carefully evaluated and eliminated. Centric stops should be present on flat surfaces. Movement in the frontal plane has been described in two forms. In both cases, the base rotates around an axis passing longitudinally through each side of the mandible. In the first illustration, the base may rock around the ridge, which may occur from using a stress breaker type base attachment or a weak major or minor connector. Another is commonly noted when one side of the partial dislodges when pressure is placed on the contralateral side. This could be due to a framework that is not seated passively or inadequate retention. Lever forces are more favorable for the retainer the further away from the dislodging forces. It is therefore recommended to place retention as far posteriorly as practical. Clasping is more efficient if the retentive area is on the side of the tooth facing the edentulous area. Clasping of multiple teeth is preferred over too much retention on one abutment. The embrasure clasp should be considered to clasp multiple teeth. A basic understanding of the motions of the partial denture can take a lot of the mystery out of the partial denture design. Limiting these movements may prevent unnecessary trauma and patient dissatisfaction. Bases should be well adapted. Periodic recall and relining of the extension base partial should be part of the patient's treatment plan. Clasping should be sufficient to retain the partial from reasonable dislodging forces and stress should be distributed around the arch to the extent possible. Occlusion should be harmonious with the patient's acquired occlusion, and planned alterations to the occlusion should occur prior to partial denture construction. All components should be rigid, with the exception of the terminal one-third of the cast retentive clasp. The framework and retentive clasp should be passive and fully seated.